right. Hello. Is everyone feeling the Friday energy? This me? Okay. Uh, what questions do you have about uh, the big O complexity stuff for the lab? Any weird Java stuff you've come across? Sir. I guess there's more related to big O, but how, how can we tell if the if the data structure runs log n or n log n? So there's it's an interesting question. How and how can we tell if a particular method of a data structure, say our we have a, a data structure and we have a get method, how do we tell if that's linear, logarithmic, n log n, any of these? So one way, especially if we don't have access to the code for this would be to time how long it takes for different sizes of, of input. And if it's always about the same, then it's constant. If we double the size of the input and the time about doubles, it's linear. And so we can kind of empirically find which, which of these buckets it's in. Uh, if we do have access to the code, we could go through that code modeling process. Uh, and be counting up how many steps it takes. Uh, and we're, uh, we'll talk about today um, uh, some, uh, uh, we'll see an algorithm that is, that is uh, logarithmic. Uh, and hopefully that will, will give some intuition for that. Other questions? All right, let's do... A bit of analysis practice. Uh, I'm asking you to analyze the running time, how much work this uh, mystery method will, will do in terms of the value of n that is passed into that method. All right. Some votes for all four options. Seems like it's a good chance to discuss with your neighbor uh, <clears throat> what this code is going to do, I'd say pay particular attention to how many times we're going to go around this loop. So whenever we have a loop in code, how many times we go around the loop, important to determining its, its running time. So discuss with your neighbors. All right, B or, D, uh, or C. C is the winner here. <laughs> And this is this idea of what a logarithm, like what, and as I mentioned the other, the other day, whenever we see log in computer science, it's almost always log base 2 of n. And this is asking, this will equal some value x where 2 to the x equals n. So it's like, what power of 2 would give us n? Which is to say, log base 2 of 4, what power of 2 gives us 4? 2. Log base 2 of 8. 3 log base 2 of 16, 4 log base 2 of 32. Anyone notice the, the pattern of how the values on the left and the right hand side of our equals are changing? Who can who can share share your thought? Rowan. It's like the exponent of 2 that equals the input is the input. Yeah, and we're seeing that the number on the left-hand side is doubling each time, and the number on the right-hand side is going up by 1, which makes sense because we're saying we're adding another times 2 in each of these. That's another power of 2. And so when we see a loop, 
where the number of times it's going to go around is repeatedly dividing by some number. That means if n starts as 32, the next time through the loop it will be 16, then 8, then 4, then 2, then 1, because we have an integer here when we divide 1 by 2, we end up with 0. So we're repeatedly kind of dividing uh, this, this counter by 2, and that means we get log of that number in terms of how many times around the loop we go, how many divisions by 2, how many powers of 2 fit into n. That's what our, our log of n means. Does that make sense? Any questions on this? All right, so we will we will come back to analyzing a situation where we're repeatedly dividing by two. But before we get there, we are going to return to something that uh, you probably saw in uh, 111 or previous uh, computer science class. Our good old friend, recursion. So I have here a recursive function, a function that refers to itself, a function that calls itself. So the function is called countdown, takes a number, and inside the countdown function, it calls itself. Anyone remember the name for like what we might call this n equals equals zero part? Base case. base case. So we have our base case, we have our recursive case. So take a moment and think through what will be printed out when we call countdown with the value three. All right, A versus D for the most part. Please discuss with your neighbors how you thought about uh, the series of recursive calls, how this is going to work out. Some movement toward D. That is indeed what is going to happen when we run this function. We start off with a call countdown of three. Uh, can someone tell me what what is the first thing that happens when we call countdown of three? Yeah? Uh, test if n is equal to zero. Exactly. We say is n equal to zero? It isn't. So what's the next thing we do after determining that n is not zero? Right. Exactly. We make our recursive call, which has a typo there, which would be countdown. Countdown. Uh, clown down. Uh, so we make a recursive call, countdown of two. And so our countdown of three, it's still at the point where it made the call countdown of two. It hasn't gotten to our next line yet. We're inside now, countdown of two. We check if that's zero, it's not. So what do we do in countdown of two after we check that n is zero? We make another recursive call, countdown of one. One is not zero, so we make another recursive call, countdown of zero, and at this point, n does equal zero. So at this point, we print out our blast off. And because we make our recursive calls before printing anything, 
in our recursive case, we kind of get all the way down to our base case. And so after a countdown of zero prints off blast off, what is it? What does it do next? Yeah. It returns. It returns. So we return from countdown zero. Now we're back in countdown one, picking up from where we left off. What does countdown one do after it returns from countdown zero? Yeah. It prints one, comma. Exactly. Then prints one, comma. And after that, it gets the, yeah, Elena? Why does it return just Why does countdown zero return? Why is that going to one zero? So when a function returns, it sends the program back to wherever that function was called. And so this countdown zero call happened inside countdown one. Like countdown one checked and equals equals zero, that was false because n was one, and then it called countdown zero. So when countdown zero returns, we end up back inside countdown one. It might be a little easier to see if we think of these not as the same function, but if these were all different ones. If we had some function f that called some other function g and then printed hello and we saw that g printed the number passed into it, we would expect that f would call g, we would go into g, we would print, maybe we did something like f of 5, so x is 5, we go into g, g would print out 5 plus 2 is 7, and then when g returns, we go back to wherever we were in f and continue from there. Exact same thing is happening here, but we have this series of the same function calling itself, and we keep going back to wherever that previous recursive call was made. So countdown one, prints out one, then it returns, and countdown two picks up right after the return. Yeah, well. So why does one go back to two if there's no other return. That's uh, a good question. Uh, the word, the like, the word return only appears inside our base case here. But in Java and many other programming languages, when we get to the end of a function. There's sign, and we haven't ever we haven't returned yet. There's an invisible return there. So, the, because the function just ends here, it's as it, it would be the same as if I had just put return semicolon at the end there. So we get to the end of countdown one. Go back to countdown two. So okay. are those like embedded functions within one another? Like, like with your example, like <laughs> is that how they're called going backwards? Because they're like the calls are like. Embed, not embedded in them, but like. Well, here, here's one way to think about it um, that actually ties into something that we have studied. That I have drawn these in this kind of uh, uh, nested diagram here. But actually, a nice way to think about these and the way that function calls work is they're like a stack. We call countdown three, we push countdown three on the stack, it calls countdown two, that pushes countdown two on the stack, which calls countdown one, which 
calls countdown zero. And when countdown zero returns, it's as if we're popping that off of this stack of function calls and we go back to the next one on the stack. And then when countdown one returns, we pop that off the stack and now we're back picking up where we left off in countdown two, which is where the two comma comes from. And then finally, the three comma. Uh, there, in fact, yeah, there should be a comma at the end of the three. Alas, two gets popped off. We go back to where we were in, in countdown three. Is this feel like it's making sense? Questions or, or parts of this I could explain more? Ben? So when it calls it the first view, you will say like countdown three minus one and go to countdown two. Does it essentially just skip that print statement until you get all the way to zero and then return all the way to the print statement? Yeah, so I wouldn't think of it as skipping the print statement so much as that when it makes the call countdown two, countdown three is isn't doing anything until the this countdown of two returns and then countdown three picks up where it left off. Like if we called a function f uh, and uh, f like looped, like printed out every number between one and whatever number we put in. If we put in some large number like 10 million, we would expect it, the program would take a while finishing f before we were able to continue on past the call to f. And it's the same, uh, these recursive calls are this, the same idea, that when we call countdown of two, we don't, the, we're not going to continue in this function until that call returns and we pick up where we left off. What other questions do you have? All right, there is uh, a little more meaningful of an example that I'd uh, like to go through uh, to help show what's going on. And so this is an example from uh, the uh, reading in the Bailey textbook that we have a recursive function, our public static int sum. And what this function does is uh, return the sum of the numbers from 1 up to n. So uh, if we were to do this iteratively using a loop, uh, anyone have a suggestion for how we would use a loop to get the sum of numbers 1 to n? Could you do like n equals n plus n minus i, and i keeps like getting smaller, and then eventually adds up? Yeah. What uh, what kind of loop are you? Uh, for loop. Yeah, we we could use a for loop to go from like n down to zero, or from one up to n, and just like add up those numbers inside the loop. Uh, so we could do this iteratively. Uh, but we can also do it recursively, where we can say, okay, a base case, if n is less than 1, there's nothing to add up between 1 and that number. So in that case, uh, we're just going to return 0. The so sum of the numbers from something less than 1, uh, from, from 1 up to something less than 1, that, that's going to be zero. Uh, otherwise, 
we are going to return the sum of all the numbers up to n minus 1 plus the last number n. And so let's imagine I'm really curious what the sum of all the numbers from uh, 1 uh, up to 2 is. Exciting, exciting math, I know. Uh, so I call sum of 2. That's going to fill in 2 for n. When I say if n is less than 1, it's not. Otherwise, I'm going to call sum of n minus 1. That's as if I am uh, putting on top of this another copy of this method. Except this time, I call it with sum of n minus 1. So in this version, n would be 1. I have this kind of entirely new call to my sum function, just with a different input. Now again, check is n less than 1. It's not. So I'm going to call sum of n minus 1. I'm again kind of pushing something on top of this stack. Getting another version of this function. And with this call, n is 0. So I say n less than 0, that's true. I return 0, which means I'm done with this call, and I have returned 0 for the recursive call in my, uh, uh, in the previous, uh, the, the next function in this, in this stack. So I do 0 plus 1, that's uh, 0 plus n, and n is 1 in this one. So now I return... 1 for this recursive call, add on 2, which returns 3 to my initial call. And so I think it's helpful to think about these recursive functions as you just kind of get an entirely new version of the function when you make a recursive call, just with maybe hopefully a different value as the input. So that example makes sense? Any questions on that? Jeffrey? I was thinking, in terms of complexity, is this type of method going to be the same as when using a full loop? It's a good question. Is our recursive summing up of the numbers 1 to n same complexity as using a for loop? Uh, we could ask for each uh, uh, number that we're summing up, kind of, how much work are we doing? Is it constant or something else? And in our for loop, uh, for each number that we sum up, we're just kind of adding it on to the total and then changing our loop variable to the next one. In this recursive, for each number that we add up, we're kind of making a recursive call and then doing an addition. So this would also be uh, linear, kind of doing a constant amount of work for each of the n numbers we're summing up. Other questions? All right. I have here on the screen the code uh, for an iterative method of computing n factorial. 
and factorial, meaning the product of all the numbers 1 up to n. Uh, and so among these four, these four options here, think about which of them we'd want to use as the base case for a recursive version uh, of our factorial function. Some votes for all four. Very exciting. Please discuss with your neighbors how you're thinking about uh, when we're doing this like multiplication of 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. That's the result we want. Which of these would be a good base case? Some movement towards C. That is excellent. That is, uh, I think, when we would want to stop our recursion. Roll our base cases to stop our recursion. Uh, anyone who who, uh, who chose C, uh, care to, to share how you thought about this? Why that seemed like a good base case? Yeah, Paul. Yeah, so I thought of like the base case as when you want your recursion to stop. So it would stop once you get down to zero factorial, which equals one. Yeah, I think that's that's an excellent way to think about it. Uh, or if we let n get less than 1, let n get all the way down to 0, and we're multiplying things, we're in danger of at having a factor of 0, which will just make the whole factorial 0 no matter what else is in there. Uh, so stopping at 1... Uh, is a, a reasonable thing to do. So now to fill in the other part of this recursive function, we have our base case. What should our recursive call be? Mostly A, but maybe some others. Please discuss with your neighbor why you chose the one you did. Near consensus. I love to see it. Uh, why someone uh, show us why these other ones would uh, not not give us a, a nice recursive factorial? Marcus, um, for um, return factorial n plus one, that could just never hit the base case. And same with B. And for C, I don't think it actually does anything. So it has to be A. Exactly. Then our recursive call needs to do two things. It needs to make progress toward the base case. Otherwise, this recursion is never going to end. And it needs to actually do a little bit of work in terms of computing the output that we want. Because if we only make progress toward the base case, which is what answer C does here, then we're never going, we're not actually computing the factorial, we're just like doing a bunch of calls for fun. Uh, and so we need to actually kind of do this. This recursive call is going to multiply in one of these numbers and leave the rest of the work uh, to this factorial n minus 1. Any questions on this? All right, so let's talk about uh, kind of an application of the ideas we've been talking about uh, with that first problem, dividing, uh, uh, dividing our problem in, in half repeatedly and these ideas about recursion uh, to talk about that classic uh, computer science problem, uh, bringing order to chaos, uh, sorting uh, things from smallest to greatest. And the algorithm, which you may have heard of before, that kind of uses all these ideas, is called merge sort. Uh, and this is one of uh, uh, the most efficient sorting algorithms. And it's also the one that Java 
uh, and other programming languages like Python use a form of merge sort uh, for the built-in uh, uh, ability to, to, to sort lists and arrays and that sort of thing. So very widely used. Uh, and the basic idea is we have some uh, list of numbers. Let's say we have uh, 13, 42, 97, negative 3, 53, and 18. And the idea behind merge sort is let's take half of our uh, list of items and we'll recursively sort that half and take this other half and recursively sort that half. And we'll deal with kind of putting these sorted parts together later. And we're just going to keep taking half until we get down to a base case of we only have one thing in our, in our list of numbers. And at that point, we can't kind of subdivide our problem any further. So now we're down here at our base case. And now the merge step begins. Where for each pair of lists we want to merge together, we're just going to go through each list and at each point take whichever thing is, is smaller and put that into our sorted version. So we take these two and say, okay, 13 is smaller. That'll go first. Okay, this is empty, so whatever is left in this side we'll put together. And we can do the same thing over here, negative 3, smaller, and then we'll take 53. Then we can merge these two lists together. Again, 13 is smaller. And then we, after taking 13, we compare the first two of what's left. Okay, 42 is smaller, and then 97 at the end. Repeat that process on this side. Negative 3 versus 18. Negative 3 is smaller. 53 versus 18. 18 uh, is smaller than 53, so we take that first, and then... 53 is what's left. And then finally, we merge these two together using our same, like, compare the thing at the front and take whichever is smaller. So that would be negative 3. Then comparing 13 and 18. 13 is the smaller one. 18 and 42. 18 is smaller. 42 and 53. There we go, it's 42. 53 and 97. And finally, 97. So in this example, we kept dividing our list into smaller and smaller pieces until our base case of just one. And then we use this merge process to take these already sorted lists, because they start out as just one element, and that is automatically sorted. It can't be out of order. So we take our already sorted lists and use this merge process to, we're just going to keep taking the thing from the front of one of the two lists, whichever is smaller, and putting it into our merge list. And that kind of reassembles all our pieces in these kind of repeated merges into uh, a final sorted result. And so we can 
consider what would this actually look like if we were to do it uh, in Java. So we might start with, okay, what does our uh, what does our merge function uh, need to do? And might say that our merge function is going to take in uh, three lists. It's going to uh, take in uh, a, li a list result, which is the list we're merging into, it's kind of the, the, the list that our kind of two other lists that I'll creatively name uh, list one and list two. We're going to merge list one and list two into our result list. And kind of the the basic thing that we're that we're doing is we're checking uh, if the thing at the front of list one, which we can uh, get using the peak method, which is going to return the first thing in our list, if that is less than the thing at the front of list two. That's when what we want to add to result the thing at the front of list one. Helena. Why are you the list like a So if our um, We look at the Java list interface. Uh, yes, so I think, I guess instead of peak, uh, I should be saying here get a zero. So in the in the notes for today, uh, these three, um, if we had used a, a if these were a different uh, interface, if we they had uh, been the uh, uh, the queue interface that has a, a peak method, but uh, my mistake. These should be get of zero is how we would do this with a list. And so we're going to take the first thing from list one. Put in our result, and if the first thing at list one is not the smaller one, then we'll add the element we take out of the beginning of list two. And we want to repeat this whole process. while list one is not empty. So while there are still things in list one, so exclamation point, list one dot is empty. And list two is not empty. So while our, the two lists we're merging are not empty, we want to keep comparing the thing at the front of them, uh, at the front of each list, and removing whichever of those is smaller and adding it to our result. So that, that was the process of kind of going through each of these and removing one or the other and putting it into our merge list. Does that make sense? Questions on this merge step?
So in terms of doing our uh, recursive piece, our splitting up of our two lists, merge sort and we want to merge sort some list and uh, we want to check our base case if the size of the list is greater than one we uh, want to divide them in half by uh, making two new lists. And they could be linked lists or array lists. Uh, I've chosen uh, uh, to make them linked lists, but I will need a, a left half and a right half. And then I would need to loop through the elements of my original list, loop through the first half of them and add them to the left half, and then uh, loop through the second half of them and add them to uh, the right half. So I could go from zero up to uh, we'd figure out that the left size is the size of the list over two, and then loop from I zero up to left size and for each of those just add to the left half something that I take out of my original list and if I also had a uh, right size variable, uh, I could similarly loop through uh, the remaining elements. I loop through the remaining elements of the list and add them to uh, the right half. Uh, and then the recursive part is I could just say, all right, merge sort the left half, merge sort, the right half, and after those two are sorted, then I can merge each of them back into my original list. They're running out of board, but the last line here, I would merge And the result would be my original list, because I've removed everything from the original list, sorted those, uh, all the, uh, the pieces, and then I, uh, the left and the right half, and then I'm merging back into the original list my sorted left half and right half. So uh, I, I know the code up here is uh, a little messy, 
the all the code that I, I put in the board is in the notes for today. Uh, but what I hope that you take away is that we can uh, use these ideas of recursion and of subdividing our problem uh, in order to implement this uh, uh, merge sort algorithm. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about, uh, we'll go over on Monday how we would analyze the efficiency of this merge sort algorithm uh, and how it stacks up against some other uh, sorting algorithms uh, that are out there. But what I would like to leave you with today uh, is the craggy visage of our 18th president, Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, had a hard life, uh, washed out of the army, likely due to a drinking problem, uh, had a number of failed business ventures, tried to be a farmer. That didn't go well either. Uh, and then there was uh, the U.S. Civil War, and he went back into the Army and turned out in many ways to be the right man at the right time. Became the General-in-Chief of the U.S. Army and oversaw the strategy uh, that defeated the Confederacy. Uh, one of his, his main downfalls, he was very trusting and repeatedly uh, trusted complete scoundrels. Uh, uh, and toward the end of his life, uh, lost all of his money in a Ponzi scheme. Uh, and as he was uh, dying of, of throat cancer, furiously wrote his memoirs, uh, which after his death were immensely popular and uh, managed to provide for his, his family. All right. Have a great weekend. Uh, I will see you on Monday. Uh, good luck with PostScript.